This is the North Indian city of Amritsar, and just a few miles in that direction is the Pakistani border. But just 70 years ago, that border didn't even exist. In 1947, 200 years of British rule here came to an abrupt end, and this vast subcontinent was divided. It was called Partition, and it split the states of Punjab and Bengal to create two new Muslim homelands in the East and West. Millions of Hindus and Sikhs fled to an independent India, and millions of Muslims to East and West Pakistan. In all, 15 million people were uprooted in the largest forced migration ever recorded. And over a million people died in the chaos and violence of partition, as families like my own were torn apart. Many partition survivors decided to rebuild their lives in Britain. And now, 70 years on, their children and their grandchildren are going back to discover how partition dramatically changed their family stories forever. And this time, I'll be joining them as me and my mum become the first members of our family to go back to my grandfather's village in what is now Pakistan. In this series, I and three other Britons from different religious backgrounds are retracing our partition stories. We come from all sides caught up in the violence, Hindu, Muslim, Sikh and British colonial. 70 years on, this is our last chance to learn the truth about partition from the people who lived through it. I thought that it's like doomsday. Very difficult time. My partition journey started two years ago when I explored my Sikh family history on Who Do You Think You Are? This is for my grandfather. That's for your granddad. This is Sant yes. Singh's. Yeah. <gasps> wow, wow. The story I uncovered about my maternal grandfather, Sant Singh, had a huge impact on me. In 1947, before he married my nan and went on to have my mum and all her siblings, my grandfather was married. And at the time of partition, he was away with the army and his wife, children and father died in the horror of you know, what took place. My mum was very close to her dad, but he never talked to her about what happened to his first family during partition. I have known my father as a very loving, caring, very lovely father, but I did not know he was hiding so much inside him. Mum and I have decided to finish the journey into my grandfather's past that I started two years ago. Beautiful picture. I, you know, this maybe is... 17, 18, or maybe younger than that. Yeah, yeah. Nice. And then here we go, his first wife. Wow. Pritham Kaur. Beautiful. There they are. Oh, beautiful. Handsome couple. That's right. The family story is that during an attack on their village by local Muslims, my grandfather's first wife, Pritham Kaur, took her own life by jumping into the village well. My great grandfather, Deru, and Sant's two young children, Mahindra and Rajpal, were also killed. So yeah. this is the little picture oh, of Raj, right. their son. Yeah. After partition, my grandfather's home village became part of Pakistan, and he was never able to return there to honor the family he lost. No one in my family has ever been to Pakistan to see where my grandfather lived. It's really important that I go with my mum and pay respects. So there's India, mm -hmm. Pakistan, yeah. Punjab, that's it. And we are going to here, Sahiwal. You excited? Excited and nervous? A little bit. Pakistan, here we come. <laughs> In the last episode, young British Muslim Samir set off from Manchester with his grandfather Assad to retrace their family's partition story. These are the only photographs that I have left hmm. from India, you know. And he's my father. They managed to find Assad's childhood home in the Indian city of Ambala. 
I can't help crying. I don't belong here. Assad was only seven when violence broke out here. And he and his Muslim family were forced to flee in fear of their lives. They wanted to kill my father. I want my grandson, Samir, to know the real story about my life uh, before partition. This time, Samir is following the dangerous train journey that Assad and his family took as refugees in 1947, which started here at Ambala Station. Samir will take the same route across the Indian state of Punjab to Pakistan that Assad took 70 years ago. Due to ill health, his grandfather has decided not to accompany him on the journey. I'm not well to travel, and I'm glad that uh, he's going on his own. I won't be a burden on, me, on him, you know what I mean? It's important someone from the family follows the path he took when he left Mbala during the partition because he went through hardship, he went through danger, he went through mental, physical, emotional stress. And for me going on this trip, this is the closest I can get to experiencing what he experienced. We had uh, quite a few uh, relatives who were going to Pakistan with us and we took a special train. But that train stopped and the uh, railway authorities said, uh, you'll have to get off here and your train will come tomorrow to take you to Pakistan. This train, train is not going to Pakistan. We were there without food, without water, without anything. After seven days, the train arrived. I thought that it's like doomsday. Everybody was running towards the train like mad, you know, carrying their luggage, carrying their children, carrying their wives. People were going crazy. One of my uncles pushed me into that compartment through the windows. Assad and his family were among almost four million Muslim, Sikh and Hindu refugees who, after the line of partition was announced in August 1947, crammed onto India's vast rail network to try to escape the growing violence erupting across India and Pakistan. I'm sat on the train now and I'm thinking, I'm trying to imagine this whole train absolutely full with boxes, with luggage, bags and people. I can just imagine a scared little kid in the corner like really cramped up tight. It's been so horrible for a kid to go through that. There was no room at all. So for an hours and hours, I was just sitting in that position. I couldn't move my legs. I was just crouching, you know. I couldn't complain. We were just children. We just stayed quietly, didn't make a noise. While Samir follows Assad and his Muslim family's journey west, across Punjab to Pakistan, Benita Kane is exploring her Hindu family's partition story in Bangladesh. Last time, Benita agreed to return to her father Bim Bomik's childhood home, the first person in her family to do so since partition. I'll be fine. Yeah. I'll do a good job for you. Now an eminent doctor, Professor Bim Bomik was only a child when his family fled their village in the remote region of Nokali after one of the first outbreaks of partition violence. Mum came to our room and said, shh, just run. They escaped at night, hidden on a local riverboat. The minute they got onto this boat, they became refugees. Now Benita is retracing her father's perilous journey across Bengal. She's come to Chaumahani Station, where six-year-old Bim and his family arrived as refugees 70 years ago, hoping to get a train to safety. When we entered the station, my brother-in-law made us sit in one corner and then said, keep your head down. Then he said he wants to go to see the station master. The station master advised that we don't take the passenger train because there has been atrocities in the compartments. 
Benita has come to meet one of the current station managers, Mr. Jaman, whose father worked here during the partition period. So nice to meet you. How are you? Uh, I am OK. My family um, fled from this station, I think, in October 1946. At that time, I was not born. But my father told me that there was a great riot at here between Hindu and Muslim. Mr. Jaman has a contemporary account of the attack on Chowmahani Station. Oh, wow. So it's, it's October the 21st, 1946. 46. And the headline is Refugees Attacked at Chow Mahani, Chowmahani, Some Killed. According to reports received here, mobs attacked refugees at Chow Mahani on Friday, killing and stabbing some persons with the result that the railway staff in the area were forced to flee. Railway tracks are lined with hundreds of refugees fleeing from disturbed sections. Ooh, wow, it's really shocking. And, and I think the date on here is really significant. The massacre at this station happened just a few days after my dad passed through. And actually, if they'd been at this station three days later, uh, they would have been killed. And that's a very sobering thought. By the end of October 1946, up to 5,000 Hindus had been murdered in this area and a further 200,000 forced out of their ancestral homes. The station master advised that we go in good strain. And fortunately, there will be a good strain in about 45 minutes' time. My father and my eldest brother-in-law lifted us into the good strain. Inside is absolutely dirty and smelly. And when the door was shut, it was deep darkness. You could hardly see each other, but we huddled together again, uh, holding each other's hands. because they could have been stopped at any time and, and if they'd been discovered, they would have been killed. They were leaving behind everything they knew and loved and they were leaving behind their ancestral home. So there must have been so much uncertainty of what was going to happen. It must have been so hard. After about eight or ten hours of train journey, the door opened wide and uh, my elder brother-in-law said, here we are now, safe, sound, and you'll be all okay. We thought we escaped from terror. In the winter of 1946, Bim and his family arrived safely in predominantly Hindu West Bengal. Ten months after they fled, the line of partition divided the state and their village, Mandari, became part of the new Muslim homeland of East Pakistan. 1,500 miles to the west, partition also split my Sikh family's home state of Punjab down the middle. Me and mum have become the first members of our family to set foot on the Pakistani side of the border in 70 years. It feels like we've stepped back in time. I wonder if Nanaji walked down this street. We're on the trail of my Sikh grandfather, Sant Singh, and we've started our journey in Lahore, the former capital of Punjab, a city he and his family often travelled through. I can't believe that we're finally in Lahore. I've wanted yeah. to come here for I don't even know how long. My grandfather, he was here, my father was here. I'm walking where they walked, in the streets they walked. It's overwhelming for me. It's amazing. The Lahore that my family often came through was then known as the Paris of the East, a sophisticated and cosmopolitan city in which Muslims, Sikhs and Hindus had lived side by side for generations. Don't you think, Mum, it really feels like the capital of Punjab, doesn't it? I feel like this is it, this is, this is real Punjab, but which is in the part of Pakistan now. Culture is same, food is same. People are speaking same language. So only the thing, we don't see a lot of Sikhs here. I thought we'd feel more alien. It feels weirdly like home. 
We've come to a suburb of Lahore to meet 90-year-old Muslim Abdul Ralph Malik, who lived here throughout partition. Kaisal, how are you? Salam alaikum. Lovely to and see you. you? Yeah. Well, wonderful. Thank you so much. It's very pleasant to see you here in Pakistan, in Lahore. In early 1947, Mr. Malik was a 20-year-old student with many Sikh and Hindu friends. The decision to partition Punjab sparked ferocious religious violence in Lahore, and he watched as whole districts of the city went up in flames. Before partition, what was happening? What was the sense in Lahore? Yes, Lahore was a very pleasant city, and uh, Hindus, Sikhs, Christians, and there was complete harmony among them. And I'm, and I'm just trying to understand how that then becomes a city of just Muslims. What did you see happen? How did that happen? In February 1947, I saw uh, someone uh, stabbed a Sikh uh, coming from Sikh. Somebody stabbed a, someone stabbed a Sikh. Them. And you saw that? I saw that. Once a Sikh was stabbed, another, the, a Muslim was killed. Then uh, mob mentality flare up. I show you this paper. This is 47 paper. Mm. And this is from June the 23rd, 1947. Lahore, a blazing inferno, life completely paralyzed. Hundreds of houses and shops destroyed in big fires. The biggest conflagration being inside uh, Shahalmi Gate. Shahalmi Gate, That's yes. the Hindu area. Hindu area. The huge tongues of red fires which have lit up the whole city and the suburbs can be seen from several miles away. Giving me goose pimples and shivers. It's horrific. Just to, you know, just imagine how horrific situation that was. The violence in Lahore was amongst the worst seen anywhere during partition, with both sides committing atrocities. By the end of 1947, the entire Sikh and Hindu population of the city had been forced out. I still remember very horrible scenes which I saw at that time. Mm -hmm. I try to control myself, but I weep sometimes when I remember my friends, my neighbors uh, leaving their places to India. I can't say, explain you in words what I feel now even after 70 years. To me, a 90-year-old man who experienced the horror and violence of partition is utterly incredible. I'm not surprised he can't talk about it without bursting into tears. These are wounds that will never heal. Across the border in Indian Punjab, Samir is following the train journey to Pakistan that his Muslim grandfather, Assad, made as a child during partition. For me, it's really important to trace that journey because this is the history of my family and of many, many other families. Because they all made that journey, whether they started on the Pakistan side or the India side. The lucky ones managed it, made it. Many of them lost their lives. As millions of refugees crammed onto India's railways to escape violence in their hometowns and villages, they were often heading into even greater danger. On both sides of the new border, these slow-moving trains were regularly ambushed and many arrived at their destinations with every passenger on board slaughtered. Assad and his family's train journey across the Indian Punjab took them through several Sikh areas, one of the most dangerous routes for Muslim refugees. First station, where the train stopped, that was Amritsar, which is a Sikh city. Though the windows were closed, but we could see through the little holes that Sikhs were walking up and down the uh, platform with their open daggers uh, to kill Muslims. We were so scared that they will jump into the train and they will kill all of us. The children were really scared what's going to happen, and the men were reading the Holy Quran. We were lucky to have a Muslim army regiment with us on that train because they wanted to move from India to Pakistan. 
that's how god saved us otherwise you know we would have been killed by the sikhs because they they would have killed everybody on that train samir has arrived in amritsar where 70 years ago his grandfather's refugee train narrowly escaped an attack it's a really weird experience because i'm seeing sikh everywhere as well this is amritsar you know i'm seeing people with turbans everywhere i feel fine seeing them but back then just seeing the turban would have put so much terror into him. Over the course of partition, nearly two million Muslims took the perilous journey by train into Pakistan. An equal number of Hindus and Sikhs came the other way heading for India. Hundreds of thousands on both sides never made it. Samir has come to meet an 82-year-old Hindu who was traveling in the opposite direction to his Muslim grandfather, Assad. Gyanchan Nagpal was on a train with several thousand refugees, making their way out of Pakistan, when they were stopped near the town of Pakpatan. They basically just just cleaned out the back three carriages of every. They killed everybody. Three dibbe. Yeah. Last three Last compartment. So when this attack happened, in your family, did anyone? Yes, just one. Our here was killed. Yes. The sword was killed. No, the sword. Yes. It was killed here. Our baby was killed. Were there any other injuries to your family? No. No. Okay. And you managed to escape, and then um, okay. So so what happened next? What happened after that? When you दिन के 12 बजे नहीं बजे पहले ही होंगे। वो कसूर एक स्टेशन है। अच्छा। तो वहाँ से मुसलमान पहले तैयार करे थे। ओ। तो उन्होंने क्या किया? उस जंगल में से निकल गए, फायरिंग शुरू कर दी। मैंने आपको धक्का दिया उसमें, उसको धक्का दिया वो। आखिर कहाँ? हाँ हाँ मैं समझ गया मैं। बहुत से लोग। जी जी जी। और जो जवान थे वो कुचल गए, तो मैं जी बहुत होगी बहुत तो वहीं होगी। People were dying just from being trampled। लाज जो है भरी पड़ी हैं। तो फिर क्या हुआ? हमारे हिंदुस्तान की मिलिट्री आ गई। ओके। गाड़ी लेके रेल गाड़ी। जी जी जी। तो हमारे सर में वहाँ सरदार लोग बड़े तैयार खड़े थे। हाँ। उन्होंने कहा कि मुसलमानों ने इना सरदारों ने कहा कि गाड़ी आ रही है अब मुसलमानों की। अच्छा। मुझे पता नहीं, लेकिन वहाँ उन्हें खूब कतले आम क मैं आपको छोटी सी बात सुनाता हूँ। जी। वो क्या है? दुख भरे दिन बीते रे भैया। अब सुख आयो रे। संग जीवन में नया लायो रे। तो मर दिल के दुख से वो कत्म हो गए। अब हम खुश हैं। Entire generation, <laughs> they went through so much. You know, listening to all the all the horrible things that people went through, <laughs> I feel so sorry for them because they're still living through it. <laughs> I think it's so important that they tell their stories because if anything like this happens again, it, we can't let it happen again. <laughs> It was the end of the world for so many people. It was the end of the world. We can't let it happen again. Over the border in Pakistan, Mum and I are heading out of Lahore to the villages of Punjab. Before partition, this was India's richest and most agriculturally fertile state. We're trying to find out what happened to my Sikh grandfather Sant Singh's first family during the summer of 1947. By that time, the riots in Lahore had spread to this area, then known as Montgomery District, and now called Sahiwal. No one from our family has returned here since partition. 
Are you feeling anxious or any kind I of... am little butterflies in my stomach and you know what I'm gonna see. I'm excited as well to see where my dad used to live. In 1947, my grandfather, Sant, who I call Nanaji, was stationed in South India with the British Army, away from his family. His father, Deriram, and his two small children, Rajpal and Mahindra, didn't make it out of this area alive. And the family story is that Sant's first wife, Breetham, took her own life by jumping down a well to escape attackers. For me, it's so important that we are here to try and find out the truth as far as we can know it. I want to know if there are people there who might know something about Nanaji. I want to know if anybody knows anything about Pritham Kaur. Mm. She's my, you know, she's the vision in the forefront of my mind. I think we're here, good Lord. Yes. My God. 70 years ago, this was a predominantly Sikh village. These days, it's entirely Muslim, and visitors like me and mum are a rare sight. Assalamu alaikum. How are you? I'm very happy to see you. I'm very happy to see you. I'm very happy to see you. This is our friend. My grandma was here. This village was one of thousands built by the British in the 19th century to serve a huge canal system which still irrigates this area. Each village, or Chak, was given a number, and this one is still known as Chak 44. There are still people here who remember partition, and one of them is 90-year-old Haji Pir Hakim Ali. Wow, wow, wow. Thank you, thank you, Ji. So did you know my grandfather? Do you know Teru Ram and Wow. Do Teru Ram and Singh Mr. Ali has offered to show us Deru and Sant's old house. I cannot believe okay. somebody went to school with my dad. Oh, I'm holding hand of my dad, I feel like. Allah During partition, Sant's wife Preetham and his two children were living here with Deru while he was away serving in the army. It's huge. Today, the house belongs to a Muslim family who've kindly agreed to let us look inside. Assalamu alaikum. Ki hal hai tada? Very good question. First class. Hey, my ma. Mere babbe da ghar. Chalo, tadi kar. Thank you. Tadi hai, tawa dai rahe. Tadi kar. Tawa dai rahe. Assalamu alaikum. Wow. Oh my god. It's really basic. Yeah, it is. And this is where they lived? Yeah, where my dad spent his childhood. Amazing. My happiness is that it is not empty. Somebody's living here and making good use of this land, this place. It's not ruins. There is a life here. Bless this house, bless this land. Mr. Ali was here when partition violence broke out in this area. And I want to know if he remembers what happened to my great grandfather Deru Ram and my grandfather's wife and children. Babuji, I'm going to show you a photograph. I'm going to show you a photograph. Yeah, yeah. Sant Singh. Sant Singh. Hanji Thordi Dost, your friend. Yeah, my great friend. This is Sant Singh's wife, Pritam Kaur. Hanji. Do you know her? He's obviously finding it very difficult to talk about it. We should know what happened. In 1947, my grandfather wasn't here. 
I need to know what happened at that time. मेरे जो मुसलमान बाकी आबादी मुसलमानों के ज्यादा थी ये तमाम जमा हो गए उनको मारने के लिए सिखों को ये हिंदुओं को भी जब लड़ाई शुरू हो गई सी मेरे टेरू राम कितने गए सी वेन वेन So when the violence started, he left. He went to Chuck 47. Year 45, all the Hindu, Sikh, all came out. And fair, fair. What happened then? The rest of the Muslims were there. They came out and put them in the jail. They were very violent. They did one thing. 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 जो एक जान थे वो दुश्मन हो गए एक दूसरे के अच्छा अल्लाह की मर्जी बस बाबा जी आई एम ट्राइंग टू अंडरस्टैंड इस वेल मैं समझने की कोशिश कर रही हूँ कि किधर हो सकता है हाउ डिड दिस हैपन I'm trying to understand. बेटी पूछने के लिए दुखों बड़ी कहानियाँ और बहुत बड़ी दुखों बड़ी कहानी. Wow. Thank you. Thank you, जी बाबा जी तो सिमन नुगल पूरी खोल के सच्ची तरह दस्ते. I'm so grateful for your honesty. तो सिर्फ बस दुआ दो मैंने. I always thought my great grandfather died somewhere in this village. He didn't. He died in a neighbouring village. Where he went for refuge with all the other Hindu and Sikh families, I'm really grateful that he talked to me about it. He didn't have to; he could have just done what people have done for the last 70 years and said nothing. I have to go to. Chuck 47. I have to go to the place where all the Hindus and Sikhs of this area were slaughtered, and I still need to find out what happened to Pritham Kaur. As Punjabi villages like my grandfather's descended into horrific religious violence, over a thousand miles to the east, partition had split the state of Bengal to create the new Muslim homeland of East Pakistan. Hundreds of thousands of Hindu refugees began to pour across the new border, desperate for food and shelter. Benita has come to the Indian town of Chandanagar, near Calcutta, where her father Bim and his family arrived in early 1947. I'd heard the story of how the family had had to escape, uh, but I don't think I really understood that they arrived here as refugees. I'd like to understand more about that time and, and, and what that was like for them. My father did manage to bring about 8,000 rupees in those days, I think plenty of money, but he put the money in the local bank and then they ran away with the money. Bank is failed and closed. I looked at my father, the darkness descended on him he went pale. He just lost everything. With five, six months to feed. He was absolutely devastated. And we started to starve. The huge influx of refugees into West Bengal overwhelmed the authorities, who struggled to provide food, shelter and clothing, as over 12,000 people a day continued to flood into the region. Benita has arranged to meet her father's older brother. It's the first time she's seen him in 15 years. I've come to see my uncle Shamal. He's the only surviving uh, member of the family from that generation that's still here in Chandanagar. Yeah. How are you? <laughs> Benita came here often as a child to visit her grandmother Ashalata, though she never met her grandfather Jamini Bomik, who led his family to safety during partition. 
As destitute refugees, Jamini, Ashalata and their children were offered a room in a deserted colonial mansion in the centre of town. It's such a grand building. I don't think I was really expecting it to look so grand and beautiful. And how many families used to live here? 35. 35 families? Families. As refugee camps across West Bengal overflowed, empty buildings like this were taken over by desperate migrants who often lacked even the basic means of survival. Yeah. Where are we going? In here? We are very fortunate in a sense they gave us the largest room available of that mansion. We are all obviously sleeping on the floor and uh, at least we have somewhere to stay. That was a relief. So there were seven brothers. Seven brothers. And your sister. Ah. And her family. Sister, Remy. Acta is sister. One sister, sister. Ah, yeah. One sister. And your mum and dad. Yes. And you were all living in this room. Mm. 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 Mount here. Mm. Yeah. All in a, in a row. Mm. 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 We had a good neighbor, so he saw that uh, we haven't eaten and he will give us a kilo of rice. But my father wouldn't eat. He was a rich man, only a few weeks ago. Now he's a pauper, can't feed his own children, his wife. He started to lose weight. He became very, very weak day by day. I was with his companion. Can you show me where Dadu used to lie and where my dad used to look after him? Whereabouts was that? Dadu In that corner. Corner. He would just hold my hand, wouldn't say anything. He was so weak he could hardly move. I used to lie ah. So he used to lie here with his head, head here and, and legs over there. So my daddy used to sit here and study and look after him. He was quite small. Unable to pay for medical help, Jamini's family were forced to watch as his health deteriorated. I sat with him. And he suddenly held my hand tight. And he said, be a good doctor one day. And he passed away. Looking relieved, in one way, in my mind. I think he was praying for it. Take it away. Till today, I feel that God was very cruel to us as far as Father is concerned. It's just something a child should never have to go through. And just really brings it home sitting, sitting here in, in this room where it happened and what they went through. After his father Jamini's death, Bim's siblings went to work to ensure that he could go to school. Honouring his father's final wish, he went on to study medicine in Calcutta before moving to Britain in 1969 to work as a doctor. He went on to become a renowned consultant in the care of the elderly. My granddad would have been really proud of him. And I think he worked his whole life to fulfill my granddad's dream that he would become a doctor and he spent the rest of his life caring for people and curing people in a way that he, he couldn't do for his own dad. And it kind of makes sense now. Yeah! 
Samir has arrived on the Indian side of the Wagha Atari border crossing between India and Pakistan, where every evening the flags of these two nations are ceremoniously lowered and the border gates are closed. His grandfather Assad arrived here with his family 70 years ago on a packed refugee train when the border post had just come into existence. All those people sitting on the roof of the train and they thought that we have reached Pakistan. They didn't realize we are still inside India. So they started slogans. Pakistan Zindabad, that means long live Pakistan. Pakistan. Indian army, they didn't like that, that uh, we were shouting all those slogans. So they started firing. And I could feel the sin, that, that sound of that bullet that passed near my bullet. God save me. Otherwise, you know. <laughs> so both me and my grandfather have been to the Wagga border crossing now, but 70 years apart. When I was sat there and I looked at the people who were sat on the Pakistani side and I looked at the people who were sat on the India side and it made me think that this wall is separating family. People who would have grown up together, people who lived together, people who had strong, long-lasting relationships were all of a sudden separated by a wall. Assad was eight years old by the time he finally made it across the new border. 70 years on, Samir has also arrived in Pakistan to retrace the final leg of his grandfather's epic train journey. Assad and his family joined more than 7 million Muslim refugees who arrived in Pakistan during partition. Like many of them, they disembarked at a station on the outskirts of Lahore in early 1948. When we arrived, we were so tired, you see, we were so hungry, we were so cold. But we had some water at least from the Mughalpura station. That was our first night in Pakistan. Welcome to Mughalpura station. Thank you very much, thank you very much. Come on, let's Samir go. has come to Mughalpura to meet Dr. Anusha Malik, an expert on the experience of partition refugees. If you look around now, it wouldn't have looked anything like this 70 years ago. The amount of people on this platform would have meant that you could barely move. If you think about the numbers, between August 1947 and March 1948, 1.7 million people came from India to Pakistan by train. A significant portion of them would have stopped at this train station. Wow. Yeah, the, the numbers are actually staggering. Where would they actually stay? They did spend uh, nights and sometimes weeks on the platform. I've got some photos here of refugees arriving, if you want to take a look at them as well. Wow. So you can see the level of overcrowding here. Gosh, there must be thousands and thousands of people on that train. And since there were 50,000 coming in literally every day by this point, there would have been trains that were even more crowded than this. And see, people have just stopped and put their clothes and their belongings yeah. on the platform because they don't know what to do with them. Everybody just building a shelter anywhere and everywhere they can. The government was just overwhelmed, just because of the sheer numbers that were completely unplanned for. It was night time when we reached Mughalpura. My father had no job. Uh, he had no clinic, nothing. And we were short of money. We had no home to go to. So we stayed that night on that platform. Your family was one of millions who came into Lahore at that point in time and then had to struggle to figure out what it meant to be Pakistani. They had a strong sense of patriotism, a strong sense of belonging. And really, it was those refugees then that laid the groundwork as citizens of a new state. So in that sense, it is possible to say that perhaps if there were no refugees, there may have been no Pakistan. It was open platform. We just made our beds on the platform. We were so tired after all that journey. We went to sleep, but something tragic happened in the morning. My youngest sister died. <laughs> 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 
she was sleeping with my mother and she was in my mother's arms. Her name was Memuna. She was the youngest child. We slept on that platform in cold weather. That's how she died. That was the first sacrifice we gave for Pakistan. People like my granddad, people who survived the partition, they need commending for what they went through. I really believe that because it, it was so, they went through so much. Despite the amount of loss that they've suffered, they survived, they lost everything and they built it from the ground up again. Assad and his family made a new and successful life for themselves in Pakistan. His father, Hamid, restarted his doctor's practice and Assad graduated from Sindh University before resettling in Britain in 1965. I think overall, the sacrifice that that generation made was huge and it shouldn't be forgotten. Samir's journey is over, and a hundred miles away, I'm on the last leg of my family's partition story. I've left mum behind as I'm worried that things might get too upsetting for her. This is the rural district of Sahiwal in Pakistani Punjab, which in 1947 was known as Montgomery District. 70 years ago, after the British announced the line of partition, which split this state in half, these roads would have been full of Sikh and Hindu caravans, trying to escape the escalating religious violence. My family fled their own village, Chak 44, to seek refuge in this nearby village, Chak 47. Pippa Verdi is a British Punjabi historian who's been researching what happened in this area during partition. Hi, Pippa. Hello, Anita. How are you? You too. How are you? I'm, I'm really well. I'm hoping you'll be able to shed some light on yes. what happened to my family here. Yes, I think I should be able to help you. Excellent. Come with me. Thank you. Pippa's brought me to the roof of a former fortified haveli, or mansion, in the centre of Chak 47, that was owned by a powerful local Sikh. My great-grandfather and Pritham Kaur, my grandfather's wife and his kids, would they have been here? We know about uh, six, seven villages. Uh, the Sikhs and Hindus from those uh, villages actually fled for sanctuary in this area. So they all came here to this haveli? To this haveli. 1,000 to 1,500 people, including your great-grandfather and his family, they came over here to seek sanctuary against a mob that were trying to attack them. And what's extraordinary here is that we've managed to find an account of what happened here in Chuck 47, which tells us what might have actually happened to your grandfather and his family. Unbelievable. It's by a High Court judge. It was a survey of the events leading up to and following partition. So if you have yeah. a look at um, The this. Sikh villages were subjected to ruthless attacks. Men, women and children were brutally slaughtered and their homes were reduced to ashes. Have a look at this part here at the bottom. Chak number 44, amazing. Chak number 44 was attacked by a Muslim mob on August the 22nd, and the non-Muslims escaped to Chak number 47. On August the 28th, Chak number 47 was attacked by a large mob, assisted by some police officials and Muslim soldiers. The non-Muslims resisted the attack for a time, but nearly a thousand of them perished. Mm -hmm. Many young women were kidnapped. Come on, heck. We don't know what happened to Pritham Kaur, my grandfather's first wife. The only account I've heard, and you know, it's nobody knows for sure, but people have said that she may have jumped in a well and taken her own life. For some reason, that's seen as more of an honourable death. Yeah. So, you know, rather than admitting that the girl might have been abducted or she might have been raped, or God knows what else might have happened to her, but it's better that she died an honourable death and killed herself and threw herself in a well rather than then be, be, be dishonoured. And that happened on both sides. There are some horrific accounts of, uh, of these things happening, both by, you know, Muslim attacks on Hindus and Sikhs, 
And equally, we have accounts of uh, Hindus uh, and Sikhs attacking Muslims. If there was a group of girls or if they saw pretty, particularly young pretty girls, they would be put aside and taken. So rape and violence towards, towards women is just another weapon of war? It's another weapon of war. It's just... Um, you can't... It makes your blood boil. Pippa has managed to find a local Muslim who witnessed the attack on Chak 47. He's agreed to meet me in the ruined living quarters of the Haveli. This is where the Sikh and Hindus, including my great-grandfather Deru and Pritam Kaur and her two children took refuge as the mob gathered. Abdul Hamid was among several young boys who watched as the fighting began. So please, could you tell me what, what you know? What did you see? To see the son Abdul Hamid Saab ki to see the si. What was happening? Maa tanu baab saro. Kasum kha ke kumga. Apni maa nu hazan na gaye. Itthe karche. Ona ne ki kitta si jodo larai hoy shuru hoy. Ena es kar de bahar ki kitta si ona. Maa tanu baab saro. Ona ne kisi mazamat hai. Os mordo, os mordo. Hanji. Ye hamla hoya si. Hamla hoya. Musliman pa. Where did they come from? 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 Where did they come so people were killing each other. Did the hamla hoyasi when the attack happened? Were there members of your family involved? Your brother. He, your own brother came. Vadda thodde kono, obviously older brother. Did he have bibiyasi? Sardar and the Ambibia, Hindu and the Ambibia, on other Nalki Hoyasi, what happened to the women? Sade Samane Kushinua, a Pende Hakaha by by Chaka, Jilly Gilda, Ote Bibianu Legendesi. Did you see any women take their own lives? To see Kay Bibianu Kud Kushi, Kardehoe de Cassi? Ne. Sanu Patani, we called Kushikinaki, Upper. No. No. Because I said that the baby was killed in the baby. Yes, I was listening to it. There is a well. There is also. So there is a well. I don't know what to do. I want to show you a photograph because you're talking about the women. You're talking about the women. And I want to show you the woman that I'm on the quest to find out about. This is my first wife, Pritam Kaur. Do you see this face? Do you recognize this face? Yes, yes. She was here. Hanji. Look at that face. She died here. See, they killed her as well. What do we do? What do we do? Allah is a good thing. God is a good thing. Allah is a good thing. Allah is a good thing. I know, of course, of course, we can only just put it onto God. Yeah, of course I'm going to... It yeah, makes me sad. It makes me sad. <sighs> yeah, it's all right. It's OK. It's OK. Allah Taala tere tera sabar pura kare khuda kar kare beta. Like every partition story is full of horror, but this one obviously has a deep impact because it's my family. They were slaughtered right here, where I'm standing, in the most brutal, horrific, tragic way. I'm just trying to pay my respects. I don't even know what to do. 
Over a thousand people died here. And it's just a rubbish dump. And I, don't, I feel so sad. I just want to, I don't know what to do. I just want to walk around and, I'm trying, I'm trying to think of all the, 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 the souls, I, you know? I keep thinking about Preetham Kaur because I'll never know for sure how she died. The fact that my family say, oh, she jumped in too well, that's because it's the easiest one to deal with. And I think that tells me something deeply profound about partition and why nobody talks about it. On some level, trying to understand that about humanity and that we all have the capacity to be that violent and vicious is really difficult to accept. By the end of 1948, over a million people had died on both sides of the border, and 15 million more had been uprooted from their homes in one of the most catastrophic events of the 20th century. Relations between India and Pakistan have never recovered, but occasionally there's a glimmer of hope. Nankana Sahib is one of the holiest shrines of the Sikh religion. Since 1947, it's been on the Pakistani side of the border. But over the last few years, Sikh pilgrims from India and beyond have been allowed to come and worship. Mum and I have come to say a prayer for my grandfather, Sant Singh, and the family he lost during partition. Deru, Pritham, Rajpal and Mahindra. This has been an extraordinary experience for me, Samir and Benita. What happened to our families during partition was unimaginably horrendous, as it was for millions of others. And it's been so important to bear witness to what happened here, to honour those who lived through it, and to remember that for us, a generation born in Britain, partition is still very much part of who we are.